It says, now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that you will bless me, not just bless me, but bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory. Somebody say enlarge my territory. territory. That your hand would be with me. And that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. And I love this part. So God granted him what he requested. My sermon title for today is Removing Labels, Lies, and Limits. Removing Labels, Lies, and Limits. Join with me in a word of prayer. Spirit of the living God, we acknowledge your presence in here. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would have your way. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to receive. And I decrease and ask that you increase in and through me. I pray that you would not only give me eloquence but effectiveness, that we can have an eternal impact on every single person in here. We come against all of the enemy's plans, and we declare that he is a defeated foe ahead of time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, I want to speak from the title of Removing Labels lies, and limits. Um, In context, the previous chapter, 1 Chronicles 4, uh, the writer completes the list of the tribe of Judah's descendants. Included is the interesting account of Jabez. So if you read 1 1 Chronicles, excuse me, chapter 3, there's just a a long list of the uh, descendants of Judah. Then it stops in the next chapter at Uh, Jabez. And this is important because it could have stopped at any of the names, but it stopped at Jabez's name. And according to the chronicler, Jabez was more honorable, honorable than his brothers. Now, that's a question that you and I should ask ourselves. Why was he more honorable than all his brothers? In other words, Jabez was special. Now, he wasn't special because he had some great victory that he did for the Lord or because he overcome some great obstacle. He was special because he uh, said a prayer that none of his brothers prayed, and it's a powerful prayer of faith that moved God to respond. And this verse 9 and 10 is that prayer. His prayer was, uh, God, bless me, enlarge my territory so that your hand will be with me and that you will keep me from evil and that I may not cause pain. And God granted him his request. Now, if this is a prayer that God is granting Don't you think that you and I should say this prayer as well? In fact, one can say this is a shadow of the kingdom come prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. One, for thine is the power the kingdom, the glory forever. Amen. There's similar requests in that prayer. So that prayer, that kingdom come, that will be done, that's not a prayer that we should recite. It's a template that we can use so we can know how to pray to God. And Jabez is also giving us a template that if we pray within this uh, guideline, we see that God will grant this request. Now, before I unpack uh, that particular passage of Scripture, give a little bit of an exegesis to it, I want to say that names and names of places are important to God. Amen? Uh, Place names, the, the, the names that God gives places, they often identify historical significance of location. For instance, we know the name Philadelphia means the city of brotherly love. We also know Jerusalem means the city of peace. Together, the word name appears more than 1,000 times in Scripture. That word name appears more than 1,000 times in Scripture. And routinely, it carries the idea of power, responsibility, purpose, authority, and most importantly, new identity. Now, this is important. In the Old Testament, we see names were important because Abram, which means exalted father, By faith, his name was changed to Abraham, which means a father of many nations. So God gave him a new name before he did a new work in his life. In fact, he didn't become a father of many nations until he was first identified not as Abram, but Abraham. We also see his wife, Sarai, 
was named Sarah, which means mother of many nations. We see Jacob, his name meant deceiver. <laughs> and after wrestling with God, his name became Israel, which means one who prevails or one who wrestles with God. Can I say this? There's a Jacob and an Israel inside of each person. And how you wrestle with God determines which one you're going to get named. If you wrestle to try to fight God versus wrestling to get a blessing of God, you may stay Jacob when God wants to identify you as Israel. Some of you may be fighting God. Some of you may be wrestling against his leadings and his promptings. Then you're going to stay Jacob when God is like, don't wrestle against me. Wrestle with me. Wrestle for me to bless your life. Fight through the, uh, the discouragement. Wrestle through the disappointment. Wrestle through the unanswered questions to see that I am still good on the other side of whatever seems ambiguous and uncertain in your life. I'm still good. New Testament names, we see Simon. We preached on that, uh, that, that upon this rock. That's a passage of scripture that when Jesus asked Simon, who do you say that I am? And he says that you are Jesus Christ, son of the living God. And he said, nobody could have revealed this to you but God. And once he got the revelation that Jesus was God, he was renamed Peter which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. What does that mean? Upon the revelation that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the church can be built. Upon the, there can be no church that is built unless there's a revelation that Jesus is the groom to the bride. So if there's a church that does not see Jesus as the Lord and Savior, uh, that's just an organization gathering. <laughs> But it's not the ecclesia, the called out ones to gather and assemble for the things of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, we get down to Jabez, which is interesting. If you look at the text, he says, or it says that Jabez was more honorable. Let's go, let's go back to that verse, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, uh, verses 9 through 10. His mother called his name Jabez. And it says that his mother called his name Jabez because she bored him in pain. My gosh. In other words, his mother named him based on her experience. She had an experience of pain. She had an experience of probably just one hurt, one trauma, one abuse after another. And she prophesied. She spoke a name over her son that probably God didn't want her to have. If you're thinking about naming your babies, do not name them Jabez. Skip that one. There's a lot of, I'd rather you name him Leviticus than Jabez. <laughs> and Leviticus, man, I love that book, but man, come on, parents, don't get too deep. Don't get too deep. Forgive me if your kid's name is Leviticus. <laughs> so Jabez's name meant pain. His mother named him based on her experience. She put a label on him. She put a label on him. While I was in prayer coming uh, to church, I have like a 25-minute drive. And, you know, for me, I, I pray in my heavenly prayer language on my way over here. And I felt while I was praying that the Lord said that he wanted to break generational pain. I felt that strongly. That some of your pain, some of your trauma, and some of your hurt is secondhand experience, not firsthand experience. That you received the mindset about something that your parents had pain in, but they didn't give that pain to God so that God can redeem that pain. So they passed down a pain, a mindset, a level of thinking that now you're living in that pain because our parents or somebody in our life can mislabel us based on their experience. And I feel the Lord wants to break that generational pain. I feel like God wants you to know him for yourself and not think a, a, a certain person, an ethnic group, or a generation is a certain way because somebody in your life said they are that way. Amen? So in the name of Jesus, I come against generational pain right now. I come against generational trauma that has been passed down. God, that, that, that you do not want us to identify with. 
And I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you will begin to remove the label that was passed down to us and you will reassign us a new name. That we won't be Jacob, we'll be Israel. That we won't be Abram, we'll be Abraham. That we won't be cursed, we'll be blessed. That we won't be sick, we will be healed. And when, and, oh, I feel heaven on this one. We won't be tolerated, we'll be celebrated. Yeah, I feel that strongly. That because you were raised in a home where somebody might have not viewed you as precious, Someone didn't see you the way God sees you. So you see yourself unworthy of love. When you think you're unworthy of love, you'll tolerate abusive relationships. When you don't think that you are a child of the most high God, you'll act like an orphan. You'll, you'll act like you don't belong in a family. When you don't know who you are, you'll accept things that God never wanted you to accept. So before the limits can be broken, the labels need to be removed. Before the limits can be broken, the lies need to be dealt with. And that's why the enemy is called the father of lies. Because if he can lie to you and you accept it, you'll, you'll protect the lie that God wanted you to fight against. My gosh. You'll protect a lie that God wanted you to fight against. You might have been born with something that God wanted you to contend to have healing for. You might think that you're unworthy of love and, and, and you just, your lot of life is to be single all of your life. If you believe that lie, you won't fight for the truth that no, God loves you. He has somebody for you. He has healing for you. He has breakthrough for you. He has peace for you. So what the enemy wants to do is make it seem like his lies are truth and God's truth are lies. Because if you can hear truth and you think it's a lie, you'll fight against it. But if you can hear lies and think it's truth, you'll accept it. And I believe God doesn't want his people accepting lies. It's time to know the word, rightly divide the word of truth. So you know what is a lie and what is a truth, and you don't accept something that God never wanted you to accept. And this is Jabez. Jabez, although his mother named him Pain, he is coming to God to remove a label off of his life. Because if you look at the last part of his uh, prayer, he says that you would keep me from evil that I might not cause pain. Why did he think that he was going to cause pain? Because his mother made him think that he will cause pain. That, that should not even been in his prayer, but because his name was Pain, and all he heard all his life, come here, Pain. How you doing, Pain? Uh, you want something to drink, Pain? Hey, are you hungry, Pain? All he heard was Pain. So he associated his identity not with the Father. He associated his identity with a man-made name, not a God-given name. So he walked around thinking he brings pain to everybody. And now he is at a, a, a crossroad where he's like, I don't want to be identified as pain. I don't want to be identified as a victim. I don't want to be identified as broken. I don't want to be identified as sick. It's time for me to get a new name, a new identity, and expose the lies of the enemy. So don't allow what caused you pain to claim a label or identity that God never assigned you. Don't allow what cause you pain to claim a label or an identity that God never assigned you. Don't allow what happened to you to be what you, what you think is your identity. That's why uh, the song says he's a way maker, a miracle worker, a promise keeper. But, but can I add something to that, uh, that song? He's also a label creator. <laughs> he can create a new label for you. Although you might have been assigned a label, God can reassign you his original intent, his original label for you. Now, when we label something wrong, we give it wrong purpose. Let me say this. I want to lean into this. When we label something wrong, we give it wrong purpose and wrong identity. See, many times parents are trying to change behavior, but you can't change behavior until you change identity. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Touch not this. Touch not that. When you build your kids up in the identity of Jesus, behavior flows from identity. 
If I think I'm a bad kid, I'm going to always act bad. So you have to be very careful what you say over your children. You have to be very careful what you say over your spouse. You have to be very careful what you say over people because if you want them to change their behavior, let's think about what names are you calling them. Are you calling them names that reinforce their behaviors or are you speaking with a prophetic tone and speaking those things that be not as though they were? It's not naming it and claiming it, but I'm going to read my Bible and the Bible says you're blessed. The Bible says you're highly favored. The Bible says that you're beloved. The Bible says that goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. So I'm going to speak what the word says, not what what I'm always seeing. Let me give you a little illustration. Imagine a nice crafted box. Inside of it is a -a one-of-a-kind piece of art, something just beautiful, made to be revealed to everybody, full of vibrant colors and intricate details, yet on the box it's labeled hazardous. It got mislabeled. Now picture that box being placed high on a shelf far from reach Because every person that sees that label assumes it's too dangerous to handle. But it's a work of art. It's it's something to bring joy. It's something to bring life to people because uh, it's a work of art. In the same way, labels we place on ourselves and others like, I'm just an introvert. See, a lot of people, you you look at me now and and you're like, man, pastor, you you can public speak. Uh, My parents is in there. my, My dad is here. I hated public speaking. In fact, I, the label was I'm just an introvert. I, I just like being by myself. But, but, but when you come into Christ and you give your life to Jesus and the Holy Spirit is working in your life, you get endowed with new gifts. You get endowed with something that doesn't associate with your old name and is associated with your new name. Amen? Amen? So, so we have to be careful how we limit ourselves. I'm just too shy. Well, if God requires you to speak up, then you better declare, I have the courage of the Lord to say something. <laughs> so, again, in the same way, labels we place on ourselves and others like introvert, failure, are unqualified. How many people have not answered the call of God because they think they're unqualified by God? You don't think you're good enough. You don't think you can preach good enough. You don't think you can lead good enough. You you just don't think you're good enough. And and, and somewhere you received the label in your childhood, in your adolescent, in your teenager years, and you never refuted that lie. So now you're an adult running from God because you think you're unqualified. I like what Jesus or what God told Adam. Who told you you were naked? In other words, who gave you the wrong label? Who told you that you have shame in your life? Who told you? told you you weren't good enough who told you you can't be called if I called you now these labels they create boundaries that limit our potential in the way we interact with the world just as the artwork deserves to be seen and appreciated we must recognize that God sees beyond our labels he knows our true worth and potential when God sees us He sees the version of us that he originally created us to become. He don't see your sin if you're in Christ Jesus because Christ covered that. He doesn't see. He sees it, but he forgives you for it. Let me say it that way. But what he sees you, he sees potential. God would never tell you to be fruitful if you weren't seedful. He placed a seed, an incorruptible seed, Jesus Christ on the inside of us. And every time we speak his word, that seed starts to bud. Every time we speak life over, that seed begins to grow. Every time we speak truth over, that incorruptible seed begins to grow and flourish And now it becomes a big tree. And now we're walking in the fruits of the spirit. And now other people can eat off our tree because we had the seed planted in us and we watered it by speaking the right names, speaking the right labels, speaking what God says over us. And this is how you begin to develop into the things of God. Some of us don't know how to walk in the calling of God because you don't know how to speak God's word over your life daily. We need a daily confession. Tell your neighbor, you need a daily confession. So Jesus interacted with those labeled by society. Think about it. The outcasts, the sinners, the lepers. He broke through their labels and saw their heart offering healing and hope. 
Now, I want us to ponder on this. Consider what labels you've accepted, either from yourself or from others. Are they keeping you from experiencing the fullness of God in your life? And if they are, we need to be like Jabez and call on God. Let's break this down a little bit more. The Bible says that Jabez called on God. What does it mean to call on God? It means to invoke divine assistance. It means to acknowledge dependence. In Psalms 34, 15, and it should be a slide on there, Psalms 34, 15 says this, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. The, the eyes of the Lord and his ears are open to those who call upon God. All you have to do is invoke that divine assistance. All you have to do is call on God and acknowledge your dependence on him, and God will be there to help you. Somebody say amen to that. Yeah. Next part of Jabez's prayer, it says that you will bless me indeed. What does it mean to be blessed? It means to impart God's supernatural favor, to call someone or something to flourish, to empower a person to prosper. Let me say that again, to impart God's supernatural favor. How many of you guys can use some of God's supernatural favor? Yeah. <laughs> to call someone or something to flourish, to empower a person to prosper. And prosperity is not about money as most of us think it. It's about shalom. It's about nothing missing, nothing broken, wholeness. If you're rich but your kids don't like you, your spouse don't like you, and you're sick and sickly, you're not really prosperous because God wants prosperity. He wants all aspects of your life. Prosperity is not about money. It's about wholeness with the Lord. It's about being whole, mind, body, soul, spirit, relationally, sp emotionally, all, and financially. Amen? Amen? Psalms 5 and 12 says this, For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him or her as with a shield. This is what the psalm says, that God will surround us with favor. Jabez is praying something that you and I can pray and God will grant our request. This is officially my first week after being voted in. And the reason why I felt God wanted me to shift a little bit from what my sermon series has been to talk about this, because I really believe the Lord wants to enlarge our territory. Yeah. Hear me when I say this. The Lord wants to enlarge our individual territory so our corporate territory can be enlarged. He wants to enlarge our scopes of relationships, opportunities. He wants to do something in our lives in a way that, that he can show you how big he is, that he is a God that can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ever ask, think, or imagine. The Lord is looking for somebody who has courage, who can pray j -bass prayers. Lord, bless me. Enlarge my terror, but not bless me just for me. Bless me so I can be a blessing to others. Bless me so I can bless my family. Bless my marriage. Bless my coworkers. Bless me so I can be a distributor for the kingdom of God. That's what he means when, when, when he's saying bless me indeed. Bless me indeed. Bless me immeasurably. Bless me so that I can be a blessing. As the Lord keeps blessing this church, we keep blessing missionaries. As the Lord keeps blessing this church, we keep blessing other churches. As the Lord blesses our life, we can bless others' lives for the kingdom of God. And I don't know if you knew this, but this whole thing is about souls. Satan wants souls, and the kingdom of God wants souls. And it requires resources to get more souls. He says, enlarge my territory. Territory means sphere of influence. God wants you to have an enlarged sphere of influence. The current sphere of influence that you have now, he, wants, he has more for you. He has more for us. If you have influence over three people, God wants to give you influence over six. If you influence groups, God wants you to influence multiple groups. If you, whatever your scope of influence is, God wants to expand it, but God, before he can expand it, he has to expose you to next level. Expectation can't be expanded without exposure first. So sometimes God will let you see the promised land before he gives you the promised land. So now you have a motivation to fight for the promised land. 
So sometimes God will bring people, things and experiences in your life to expose you so he can show you that's what I have for you. You ain't got to get jealous. You ain't got to get envious. He showed you that so that now you can contend and fight for it for your own. I came from a big church. Think about Calvary Christian Center. In fact, this sanctuary kind of looks like this. God, God expanded, he'd exposed me to what, what a church this big could look like. He exposed me to, to men of God who were integral towards their, towards, their, towards their family. He exposed me to entrepreneurs. He exposed me to great pastors. He exposed me to what compassion and kindness looks like. So I can start fighting and contending for the things that God wants me to become. This is why every single person and leader in here needs a leader. Every, let me say this. Every single person in here, whether it's this church or not, you need a pastor. Ain't it funny how, like, you got a doctor, <laughs> you got a nutritionist, you, 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 you got somebody to spot you, you, you got a, a, a workout partner. We have people in every area of our lives to help us with food, with health, with, with, with uh, nutrition. But when it comes to assigning or having a pastor over our life, that's the only area that we don't want accountability in our life. And it, it is impossible to grow in the things of God without being in a local establishment, a local church where there is an appointed, not by man, an appointed leader, whether it's Century, whether it's uh, Bear Creek, whether it's uh, uh, First Baptist, there are all kind of appointed men and women of God that God has called to this city. God has called to this region. We didn't call ourselves. The Lord called us so that way you can choose a pastor uh, and, and you have a plethora of great options to choose from so that you can come under that vision, you can come under that establishment, and you can grow in the things of God. So you need a pastor. Tell your neighbor, you need a pastor. We, we talked about dry land and rebellion a couple weeks ago, amen. I'm not going to rehash that. But enlarge my territory. And then he says, let your hand be upon me. What does this represent? The hand of God represents the presence of God on our lives. It represents his authority, his power, and his supernatural guidance. Let his hand be on my life. One of the most important things that you can ever protect in your life is the presence of God on your life. That is the most valuable thing that you can ever protect is the presence of God. Because the presence of God is not limited to here. It moves with us. So when we're in an atmosphere, when we're in a conversation, when we're in a situation and we feel grieved or we feel led, we have to follow those promptings. That's what it means to protect the presence of God. That when the Lord says, don't say that, that's gossip. And I obey that, I protect the presence of God. When the Lord says, you messed up, go ask for forgiveness. And I obey that, guess what? That's protecting the presence of God. When the Lord says, stay home today, I don't want you to go to the club. Or let me say it this way, the Christians call it the lounge. He stay home. <laughs> that's protecting the presence of God. Let me, let me say this. I, I know this is controversial because we're in Lodi, we're in, the wine, we're in a wine region when the Lord says, yes, drinking is a liberty, but I need you not to drink. Mm. My gosh. Yeah, yeah. It is a liberty that you can choose to do. It is a liberty that may not take you, it, it may not restrict you from going to heaven. But if there's a liberty that I can do, but it's not bringing me freedom, is that a liberty worth pursuing? If what I'm choosing to do that I have freedom to do is not bringing me freedom, should I do it? And I believe the Lord is requiring, not in this specific area, Christians to do things that they have the liberty to do, but shouldn't do. And, and this is not me casting a stumbling block and telling people don't do this or don't do that. I'm saying when you're protecting the presence of God on your life, he may say don't watch that TV show no more. It's stirring up all them gangster ways. There's certain shows that I be watching and then I, get, I go work out at the gym and I'm walking like this, like what's up? <laughs> and, then, and then I run into somebody at the gym like, hey, pastor. I'm like, what's up? And I'm like, dang, I got to stay away from these gangster shows. 
Because it just activates me in a way I don't need to be activated. Is it a sin to watch the show? No. But is it provoking me? Is it tempting me? Is it leading me? Yes. And because of that possibility of yes, I want to protect the presence of God on my life. So I'm going to stay away from things that don't help me govern my freedom good enough. And that's tough. Because some of us, we find more rest in our shows than we do in Christ. Some of us find more rest in our habits than we do in Jesus. Some of us go to what is legal. And just because it's legal don't mean it's morally right. Just because it's legal don't mean it's legal for you to do. Because we're not citizens of earth, we're citizens of heaven. Which means we have a higher legal code to follow. You want his power, that means you have to work within his parameters. Just because you can do it don't mean heaven wants you to do it. Let your hand be upon me. That represents the presence of God. And then this next one, keep me from evil. Keep me from evil. What is this? Divine protection. Divine protection. Every single person in here should declare divine protect. I don't go out the house. For my new Christians in here, I'm not trying to be spooky. It's, it's poetic. It's, it's, it's a, a metaphor. I don't go out the house because sometimes I realize, you know, we got mature Christians and new Christians. And when, you, when, when Jesus talking about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, that might scare some Christians away or some new ones. <laughs> like, you know what? I was for Jesus. But then he started talking about some cannibal stuff. Eat my flesh? <laughs> drink my blood? What is, what is this? But, but I don't leave the house without declaring the blood over my family. It is a habit every day, like clockwork. I might not have had a long prayer with God before I left the house, but I know that, 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 that I might not always have those one hour or these long length times of prayer, but I can say short prayers throughout the day. God, cover my children while they're at school. I declare the blood over my wife. I de- declare the blood over DJ in Fullerton. I, 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 you just start declaring the blood of Jesus. But, but let me say it this way. You can't declare the blood of Jesus and expect divine protection if you don't know all of what the blood means. If you're just saying it because you heard it and it's a Christianese, it won't release power. You have to know what the blood of Jesus means for you. And then when you say it, it releases power. Amen? Amen. So that's your homework assignment. Study on the blood. So Jabez's prayer is this. God, bless me. Enlarge my territory. Let your hand be upon me. Keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. And God granted him his request. God granted him his request. This is a prayer led or Holy Spirit inspired that we can pray over ourselves. Many Christians get scared to pray, God bless me. Because you have this mindset that, no, no, it, I, I don't care. You know, I, I, don't wanna, I, I don't ask God to bless me. I just wanna, I, I want others to be blessed. Well, I, I actually think you're being a little bit superficial, super deep. Who don't want to be blessed? We are wired to be blessed. Not according to the way people have perverted the word blessed, but we are wired and we have a connector called the Holy Spirit who can help download what heaven has for us so that way we can see it in earth. It's it's like we can be synced with heaven so that we can walk in supernatural favor. We can walk in supernatural uh, uh, guidance from the Lord. Amen? So how does the Lord enlarge our territory? This is important. He does this by opportunities, relationships, revelation, and decisions. That, that in, the Lord is going to enlarge our territory individually, but before, for him to do it, you have to see the opportunities that God is going to bring your way. You might need new relationships. In Revelation, uh, I realize the key to the supernatural is through revelation. That means God reveals something from his word specifically for you. Revelation, it's the insight into the things of God. So how do I, what does that mean? Just to kind of help you understand that. I'm reading a passage of scripture 
And that passage of scripture reveals something about God in me in my heart. He's revealed that he will always be there for me. He's revealed that he wants me to walk in the fullness of him. When you have that level of revelation, it's imparted into your spirit and revelation helps bring transformation. How do you think people can read the Bible and don't get transformed? How do you think that there's atheists that reads this word and never grow in the things of God or still don't believe that Jesus is the son of the living God? It's because they have information, but they don't have revelation. Why is this important? The world doesn't get revelation. They get conviction to come to Christ. And then once they're in Christ, then they get revelation. Believers go beyond conviction. We now get revelation because we belong to God and God will speak to us. He says, a stranger's voice, my people won't follow, but my sheep know my voice. In other words, you and I are in a covenant of revelation. God will reveal his will to you. He will answer your prayers when you call and you cry out like Jabez did. Jabez called. He invoked divine assistance. He claimed his dependence on God and God heard him somewhere in Jabez's life he caught a revelation that my mama called me pain but I shouldn't be called pain somewhere he caught the revelation so our opportunities our relationships our revelations revelation excuse me and decisions pastor Jim there's a la- label maker by Kim's desk can you grab that for me now in order for God again to enlarge our territory decisions Somebody say decisions. Decisions. This is tough because your decision determines your destiny. Your decision determines your destiny. Just because you want to be blessed, just because God wants you to be blessed, just because you want something don't mean you're going to automatically acquire it out of want. It, It don't happen that way. You can want it all you want, but until you make a decision, But not just a one-time decision, but consistent decisions of choosing God above everything else. This is what begins to enlarge our territory. So yes, you obeyed God in one season, but you also disobeyed him in another season. Yes, you said yes to God over here, but you're saying no to God over here. You can't compartmentalize God. You can't say, I'm going to say yes to God in my relationships, but no to God in my finances. Yes to God in this, but no to God in that. This is why he says worship me with all your heart everything within you because he wants all of it tell your neighbor he wants all of you god will enlarge our territory if we are willing to stop holding on to fruitless things god will enlarge our territory if we are willing to stop holding on to fruitless things fruitless habits fruitless relationships fruitless offenses. You got, you, you got offended, and when you're easily offended, you're easily to take off, of course, to purpose and destiny. See, the only thing that the enemy has to do to get you out of God's will is just to get you offended. And as soon as you get offended, now you're, you're making absolute statements. You're putting everybody in this one category, but it was one person who did that to you, but you're demonizing everybody for it. Thank you, Pastor Jim. Give it up for Pastor Jim, y'all. So we don't rise to the level of our goals just because you want it. We rise to the level of our systems, a systematic way of doing life. We don't rise to the level of our goal. Let me say it better this way. We actually fall to the level of our systems. I was just telling my wife uh, yesterday, and, you know, we're very uh, structured people. And my current structure has allowed me to grow, allow the church to grow, and other areas of my life to grow. But there's new growth coming. There's new things happening. And I found myself getting a little bit more irritated, a little bit more agitated, a little bit more stressed. And I realized that the, the stress, the irritation, the agitation is coming because I heard the Lord say, it is time to upgrade your systems You have a system from a previous system or previous season, but what you're asking me to do in this next season, I need you to upgrade your structure. I need you to upgrade the way you do things. If you stay in an old system uh, but want a new season, what you're going to do is just get 
frustrated. You're, you're going to just get disappointed. But every new season, if God is going to enlarge your territory, he has to enlarge your capacity first. So you got to make room for the Lord. You got to clear some things out. You got to let go of some habits. You got to let go of some relationships. And you got to let go of some things so that God can build a new system so you can step into a new season. Think about it, the children of Israel, the first system was, I, I will meal prep and give you manna. But in order for them to go into the promised land, he's like, that system of me bringing you manna every day ain't going to work. I need you to now hunt and kill for your, yourself. I need you now to eat from the produce of the land. In other words, they went from a system that allowed them to get out of Egypt into the wilderness, but God introduced them to another method to go from the wilderness to the promised land. Yeah, you're not in bondage anymore, but you're not in the fullness of God. So you're in this season and you're wondering why everybody, oh, I, I feel heaven on this one. You're wondering you're wondering why everyone is getting promoted around you. You're wondering why all the good things are happening to people and not yourself. And it's okay to ask that question, but if you're going to ask that question, you also got to examine their systems, their structure in life. You want what others have, but are you willing to do what others do? In other words, you are where you're at because you haven't upgraded your systems in life. You haven't upgraded the way you do things. You still are a good Christian that cusses. You still cuss. You've been saved for 20 years and you still cuss. Like literally, you still cuss. Think about that. And the Bible says blessings and cursings can't come from our mouth. That we are to either do this one or the other one. And let me say it this way. The curse that you're giving to others, it come out of your mouth first. So it's, it's hitting you first before it hits them. You can't curse another person without it cursing you. Because as children of God, we are not called to curse. We are called to bless. Come on. We are called to bless. Come on, come on. We are called to bless. Yes. Come on. God put a watch over my mouth and a guard over my tongue. Help me to speak things that are only edifying to you. God, help me to stop cussing people out. Help me to stop being a cussing Christian. Help me get rid of my carnality, Lord. Help me to grow. I don't want to keep going around the same mountain, the same circumstance, the same situation. God, help me to grow in the things of you. Now, I think this is pretty, pretty cool. Let's go to 2 Samuel. I'm coming to a close. If you're following on, along in the notes, I might, you might have saw that I skipped some things. But 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 3 through 5. And before I get there, I want to say this. We can't allow experiences, setbacks, or disappointments to claim a label on us that God never assigned us. Every season that we go through, it will have blessings and burdens. Every season of our life will have blessings and burdens, power and problems. Here, lean in on this. God uses these seasons to teach us how to swim in troubled waters. He's teaching us how to tread troubled waters longer. I, when I first learned how to swim, I used to stay on the rail. You know how you stay on the rail like this? And they'd be like, come out, come swim. And you'll go out a little bit and then you get scared and you jump back. God is trying to teach us to leave the rail and go swim, go tread water. He's calling us to leave the harbor and go into the deep things. And, I, and you know what I realize is we can't go into the deep things of God until God gives us a tsunami amount of hope. Uh, just a, a wave, an ocean of hope. It's hard to go into the deep things of God unless you've been filled with the hope, the possibilities of God. Because when I'm, motivate, when I'm motivated by hope, I'll take risks. When I'm motivated by hope, I'll leave the harbor. When I'm motivated by hope, I'm speaking to some young adults, I'll leave the nest. <laughs> when I'm motivated by hope, I'll give my parents some rent money. <laughs> Come on, you, you, you 25 and you still live with your parents? You can't give them something? I know they ain't asking for it, but give them something. 
No shame, no shame. We are called to build. Let me say it this way. God designed it, and we build it. God designs our life, and we co-labor with him to see it come to pass. We are called co-labors with God. We are all called to be builders, not just hopers, not just dreamers or wishers, but builders. And guess what? Builders are worshipers. It is impossible to build in this season. It is impossible for God to enlarge our territory if we are not worshipers of the one and true living God. Worship doesn't start on stage. It starts privately. Worship starts in our life. It's a lifestyle. It's not about singing. That's an element to it. But worship is, I have a lifestyle of obedience to the Lord. Worship is how we treat the barista who got our drink wrong. Worship is how we treat people who made us mad. It's a lifestyle of knowing God is my source. Since I love God and God loves me, I'm going to treat everyone with dignity, with honor and respect. So we are called to be the builders, not just hopers, dreamers, and wishers, but builders, and builders are worshipers. We may not all be teachers. We may not all be pastors. We may not all be entrepreneurs, firefighters, police officers, politicians, doctors, whatever. But we can all access the master builder through worship and play our part to contributing to God enlarging the territory of Century Assembly. Come on, you can clap for that. And we do this by an attitude of worship. Now, I'm a, you guys know what this is, right? You might have heard me say it when I asked Pastor Jim. What is this? Just call it out. A label maker. This is a label maker. And when I think about label makers, it's simple, right? Small, but it's powerful. And when I press the buttons uh, and type a name or a description, it produces a label that I can stick to whatever I choose. So I could put a label on this and say, you know what, this is not a, this is not a chair or a table. I'm going to call this a chair. You can, you can just label things wrong, right? You can label it based on your own understanding. And the name or the description of a thing that is labeled comes from the one who holds the label, the label maker. So whoever the label maker, whoever has the label maker in their hands, they determine what and how something gets defined. What if I were to tell you, you put your life in the wrong hands? You put your identity in the wrong hands. You are putting your life, your identity in people. And, and, and they're assigning you wrong labels. They're assigning you wrong identities. Because you put your trust and you put your confidence in what man says. And there's an element that God uses man, but man is not supposed to give us our identity. Man is supposed to facilitate the identity that God already gave us. Man is supposed to partner and uh, affirm and validate what God has already declared over us. And you've been labeled certain things. And in order for you to take the limits off your life and live a limitless life, you got to take your, your, your life out of the wrong hands. Come on. When, when, when I think, yes. God told Jeremiah, in chapter 18 in the book of Jeremiah, go to the potter's house. Tell me what you see. He goes to the potter house, and he sees the potter making things with his hand, and it's, it's clay. And then he saw that the, the, the potter at, at the working of the wheel can change what was once clay and work it into a different vessel. And he says, this is what I will do for Israel. I will change who they thought they are. I, I can work them into a different vessel. It's amazing what can happen when you put your life in the potter's hands, when you give him the broken pieces of your life, when you give him the labels, when you give him everything that others have spoken over you, when you give him all the false identities, what God does is once you place your life in his hand, he begins to compute and say, you are no longer sick, you're healthy, you are no longer bound, you're free, you are no longer defeated, you are victorious, you are no longer cursed, let me slap this big one on you. You are blessed and highly favored. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, the lender and not the borrower. Everything you touch shall prosper.
because I labeled you correctly. You are not your pain. You are not your trauma. You are not your experiences. You are who I say you are and you are blessed. You are loved. You are firm. You are highly favored. Sit down. I'm, I'm not going to be able to get to this passage of scripture. But we see in 2 Samuel chapter 9, there's a person called, let me get this right, Mephibosheth. And that name Mephibosheth, I think we have it on, on one of the slides. His name means shameful one from the mouth of shame. And he got this name because uh, when his dad, Jonathan, was, I think it was a, a battle or something, and the, the person who was watching him grabbed him and ran and, and dropped him, and, and both his feet became lame. So they identified him with his experience. And some of us in here, we may be crippled by certain things that happen to enter our life. You might have got, not got the parents you wanted. You might have not got the opportunities you wanted, and you feel crippled in life. We feel like Mephibosheth, where we feel full of shame. We feel condemned. We feel unloved. We feel unworthy. And not only did his name mean shame, he lived in a place called Lodabar. Let's put that up there. And that word Lodabar means the place of no pasture. David, after he became king, he began to seek to restore things that belonged to Saul's house. And he began to say, Who, who's left in Saul's house? The, 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 the house of Saul that I want to bless. And David is a shadow in this moment of Christ because there's nothing Mephibosheth did to earn what David was about to do for him. But because Mephibosheth's father was Jonathan, because his father was royalty, kindness belonged to him. And you might have not done anything to deserve the goodness of God, but because your heavenly father, because of Jesus Christ, kindness belongs to you. Goodness and mercy belongs to you. And the kindness and the favor of God is what you deserve. So David sees Mephibosheth. And he blesses him. He says, you will always have a seat at my table, you and your kids. And he took Mephibosheth out of Lodabar, out of a place with no pastures, and brought him into a place full of refreshment, full of food, and had him sit at the king's table and had him sit where there was dignity, where there was honor, and you might have experienced some things in low places. You might have been on drugs. You might been divorced. You might did bankrupt, whatever it may be, that made you feel like you were in a low place. But I hear the Lord saying, I'm calling you out of low to bar, and I'm calling you to a seat at the table. You don't got to live in low to bar. You, you are not full of shame. God is saying, no, no, I took that shame. I bore your griefs. I carried your sorrows. 